Sun and wind. Using them for electricity used to be a utopian dream. It is renewable, the fuel is free, it lasts forever, and in terms of environmental impact, uh, it, it's practically nothing. This is our moment, a comprehensive clean energy bill for our country. You could generate all the electricity that the United States needs with a 100 mile by 100 mile grid of, of solar power. Leaders in California are aiming to generate 50% of their electricity from renewables by 2030. 50%. Nearly two weeks of talks and more than two decades of meetings. More than 190 countries make a universal deal to address climate change. Today is also the day that we choose to assert ourselves as a global leader in transitioning to 100% renewable energy and charting that path. These technologies aren't science fiction. They're ready to be installed and scaled up across the country right now. And I might add, windmills do not cause cancer. One of the things about Osage County is it's known for its rolling hills and it's known for its beauty, you know, green country, that type of thing. Whenever the tribe bought this land, Osage County, it was actually our southern hunting grounds and it was purchased with the money from the lands in Kansas and Missouri because really nobody else wanted it. Well, and then of course, oil was discovered here. And in my opinion, ever since that happened, whether it's the land, whether it's the head rights, everything that the Osage have from the beginning up to date, someone wants. In 2011, Enel filed for a permit to build a wind project on the Osage tribe's traditional land. Chief John Red Eagle said the project would likely intrude on sacred burial sites, which poses a major threat to the tribe's culture. The tribe's fight against Enel is the longest running legal battle over wind energy in American history. Creating shared value is Enel Green Power North America's sustainability framework that incorporates social and community issues. Creating shared value is not just about being a good neighbor, it's about earning and sustaining our social license to operate, and by doing so through listening and partnering with local community partners. If I had the power, boom, they'd be gone. <laughs> I'm 89 years old, so I, I may be the, the oldest full blood in the tribe. I wasn't pleased with it at all, and still not. It kills uh, birds like eagles. I don't like that. Many tribal members have objections because of the fear of damaging sacred birds, particularly eagles that would be caught up in the turbine blades. There are also people who are concerned about excavating. The foundations for these 40-story turbines would uh, disturb possible sacred sites. The size of them is intimidating. We would watch them haul those blades in, and my gosh, they're as big as a plane. The wind company contacted probably six or eight landowners in the area and signed contracts and started excavating the foundations for the wind turbines. Many of us began to 
be concerned about this because they started digging these immense holes just north of Fairfax. And they were digging huge chunks of limestone out of, out of the earth and putting them into rock crushers, turning them into gravel, feeding them back into the pits as foundations for these wind turbines. So our question then, gee, whose rocks are these? And of course, we already knew the answer. Very likely, they were the tribes. It's an underground reservation. That means that we own the, the minerals, the mineral state, six inches below the topsoil. So the chief asked the Bureau of Indian Affairs to investigate. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs did the math, said, well, OK, so approximately 90 pits for 90 wind turbines. By the time they dug out that much mineral and rock, it would constitute legal mining of the mineral estate. So the BIA, a representative of the United States government of the Interior Department, wrote in L. Wind Farm a letter saying, cease and desist excavation until you receive a mining permit from the tribe. The Interior Department told them to stop construction out there and then, from what I understand, whenever they found out that there might be a problem, they hurried up to finish what they were doing to put all those windmills up there. When they ignored that, we were all horrified. Said, well, gee whiz, look at that. They're building even faster. They don't own it. It's private property. That's not exactly true. You see, when the Osage bought their reservation, they also bought the mineral rights. Everything that sits below the surface belongs to the tribe. The oil, the natural gas, and even the rocks. You want to mine that stuff, you have to pay the tribe. But Enel ignored both the tribe and the Interior Department. Why? Follow the money. Since 2015, Enel's been collecting about $10 million per year in federal tax credits from the Osage Wind Project. And that's before they sell a single watt hour of electricity. Construction of the turbines is expected to begin in the next month or two, while the Osage Nation continues to explore legal avenues to stop it. Some of our legal people said, well, you know, we've seen this kind of strategy before when powerful people across the country do something a little shady or illegal. They go ahead and do it anyway, based on the premise that if they put enough money into it, it will be too big to fail. Tell me why the tribe has been so opposed. What is it about this project that has inflamed the tribe so much and, and, and Osages like you? We bought this reservation uh, with, with our own money. When the Italian company came in, they didn't respect our sovereignty as Osage people. They tried to just run right over us. This was a total ignoring our rights just completely dismissed us as anything that they needed to take seriously. To me, it all comes down to the money. It doesn't benefit the Osage whatsoever. With the way they just bulldozed in and disregarded the government, disregarded the tribe, disregarded the minerals estate. NL is a long line of exploiters, if you will, who've decided that this is something they can do and not have to pay much for and make, you know, lots and lots of money. This reservation mean, means a lot to us. You know, this is home. This is our, our landscape. You know, we're not going to just lay down and let people manipulate and try to run over us. So, you know, we continue to fight them in court. So what's the remedy here? For the wind turbines to be taken down and for them to be gone from the Osage Reservation. We want them torn down, yes. Now, that may be a dream, but I mean, that's, that's what I would do. They're there to stay. We're not going to bring them down. We wish they were, but uh, they're there for good. It's not just the Osage who are fighting wind projects. Since 2015, local communities from Maine to Hawaii have rejected more than 400 wind projects and over 150 solar projects. Why? Renewable energy is politically popular, but nobody wants to live next to oceans of solar panels or forests of wind turbines. With billions of dollars in tax credits at stake, big corporations aren't worried about lawsuits, 
especially when Uncle Sam is footing the bill. Renewables have long storied history and have been caught up in politics for a long time. Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the roof of the White House. Ronald Reagan famously took them down. It's quite intuitive for people to understand that there's a lot of power in solar energy, we feel the wind, and the idea that you can get something for nothing. People find that enormously appealing. The idea of using renewables is really popular because it's almost poetic in a sense to be able to tap the power of the sun or the force of the wind. The wind turbine itself has become a cultural icon which symbolizes the renewable energy industry and suggests simultaneously a flower and a crucifix, sacrifice and redemption. It's a spin doctor's dream. You know, the mainstream environmental narrative is very pseudo-religious. We've sinned against Mother Nature by industrializing, by modernizing. Uh, we need to go back to a beautiful, romantic, mythical past, the Garden of Eden, um, and repent for those sins. The idea that we can get energy from renewables has led to an auction of, of expectations that policymakers will say, well, let's go 60% renewable by 2040. And it becomes popular to say, well, let's go 70% by 2035. Oh, forget that, let's go 100% by 2030. And a lot of these promises are politically popular. Today, it's very common to say net zero. So no emissions by a certain date. The world would need to deploy about one to two nuclear power plants worth of energy every day between now and 2050. And it, while they're doing that, would have to retire an equivalent amount of fossil fuel infrastructure. So whether that's a coal plant, natural gas, you name it. If you don't like nuclear power, then instead of one nuclear power plant, use 14 million rooftop solar panels. Obviously, we're nowhere near on that pace. The sense of wanting to save the world is a very messianic impulse. And to some extent among young people, it's a healthy phase of development. But if you don't have a traditional religion to rely on, it ends up becoming its own apocalyptic religion. And that's what we've seen with renewables, with the war on nuclear, and now with climate change. The strange turn that we have not quite gotten past is that there was a form of loving nature and wanting to preserve and protect nature that thought of human beings as a form of contamination or pollution just by their very ratty biped existence. Strong supporters of their environmental and you know, save the earth talk. I saw that similar to um, Vietnam when I was growing up. My generation would do anything we could to end the war in Vietnam. The environment has become their Vietnam. Human beings are biological creatures. And the notion that they could live on the planet without engaging with the production of food, with the channeling of water, the notion that they would somehow or other not be complicit in the changing of nature, well, that's gone. People make a lot of personal decisions on their lifestyle to eat meat, to not eat meat, to fly, not to fly. I, I wouldn't be against anyone for making any personal decision like that. But the important thing to understand is that the biggest lever that we have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions is how we produce and use our energy. Efficiency is great, but it's not going to get you deep decarbonization. We're not only capturing energy from the sun and wind, we're storing it. So even when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, we're still powering America forward. When you think about how renewables are portrayed um, in every source of media, they are seen as the savior to all of our environmental woes. And what is always left out of that narrative is the fact that they don't work when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. And the ways that we adapt to it are either burning gas or digging up a lot of the earth to make batteries, which haven't been proven to work at scale. 
people tend to be very dismissive about the problems of intermittency. Oh, there'll be batteries. And like I say, you'll need three times as much to have batteries. Just to produce one turbine, we have to extract 900 tons of steel, 2,500 tons of concrete, and 45 tons of non-renewable plastic. Then we've got to transport that and burn fuel, getting it all carried across the world and put up. And none of these things that go into a turbine are renewable. They're going to eventually wear out. 300 to 400 times more land is required to produce the same amount of electricity from solar and wind as from a nuclear power plant or from a natural gas power plant. They involve killing endangered eagles. They involve killing endangered tortoises. When we realize it's less harnessing and more exploiting, it, just, it doesn't feel as good. In every form of energy production, the phrase out of sight, out of mind is a problem in decision making. You cannot be so insistent that you get what you want in the way of services and resources and commodities and you don't have to notice, much less take responsibility for any of the impacts. Back in 2010, renowned energy analyst Václav Smil calculated that meeting existing U.S. electricity demand with wind energy alone would require a land area twice the size of California. For decades, the credo of the environmental movement has been small is beautiful. Renewables are anything but small. Uh, Mr. President, as you know, this important incentive, the production tax credit, moves us forward in a direction that we must go in terms of producing safe, sustainable energy by providing 2.2 cents per kilowatt hour incentive for wind energy produced. Renewable tax credits were created with two goals, and they're both very sensible goals. One was to encourage energy independence. You know, this is the product of the Carter administration, a time when we were concerned about foreign oil. But the other was to move away from conventional towards more sustainable sources. Those are goals that a lot of people would agree with. The common critique of the way we've gone about it is that it's been sort of a, a scattered, incoherent approach to alternative fuels. Today marks the 11th time I've come to the floor to urge all of us, all of my colleagues, to act by extending the PTC for wind. People come into Congress, they have a specific industry in mind that they'd really like to foster, their own local industry usually, and very sensibly so. But they're not really thinking about the big picture. They're not thinking about how these things intersect with the broader economy. That's not the same thing as a national energy policy. We're thinking micro and really need to be thinking macro about how we get where we want to be. I cannot overstate the significance of the production tax credit to my state of Montana and throughout rural America for economic development. Passing an extension now will send a good signal to business that Congress is serious about wind power. We did a report looking at tax breaks claimed by Fortune 500 companies between 2008 and 2015. Uh, what we found for next year is that they claimed a total of 7.8 billion in tax subsidies. We found something like 100 Fortune 500 companies that were able to pay zero in corporate income taxes in at least one year over that eight year period, despite being hugely profitable. It's not even a question of companies trying that hard to zero out their taxes. If you, if you give people a, an immediate tax break for capital investment, any sector that is built around capital investment, as utility and, and energy uh, are, will find it pretty easy to zero out their taxes. That is a statement as much about the effectiveness of corporate lobbyists as it is about the willingness of Congress to enact these tax breaks. It takes two to tango. If you're a utility, what would you rather have? A depreciating coal plant or a whole bunch of subsidies from some brand spanking new wind and solar? They're like, I'm not figuring out how to get this coal plant competitive. 
I'm letting it go, and the state's about to give me a whole bunch of subsidies to build wind and solar in Minnesota, to build solar in Minnesota, scenic, sunny Minnesota. The subsidies changed everything. They wanted them to jumpstart those industries. All it did, as it often does, was create a bunch of weird corruption and other problems. The U.S. wasn't alone in its love for wind and solar. Just as Texas followed California down the deregulation rabbit hole, America emulated Europe's infatuation with renewables. Sometimes when I give talks about the faults in a renewables-based energy system, somebody in the audience will stand up and say, John, you're telling us we can't have the green economy that we all want. And I reply, no, you can have it. You won't like it when you've got it. News of the moment is the energy crisis in Europe. Tell me what's happening in Britain now, because from all appearances, you are approaching the cliff at, at, uh, at very high speed. Well, as you can see, the lights are on at present. The question is whether we'll be able to afford to keep them on. The rapid introduction of renewable energy, both wind and solar, particularly solar as it happens, has degraded uh, the reliability of the UK system. We spent an enormous amount of money, 770 billion euros, on subsidizing renewable income. And that expenditure and subsidy for income has motivated a huge transfer of capital into the renewable energy sector. And what have the consumers got for this enormous transfer of wealth? Have costs of renewables fallen? No, they haven't. There's no sugarcoating it. Energy bills this winter are going to be very grim indeed. And what's been British consumers are now facing prices which are several times higher. These policies are societally destabilizing because they will increase differentials between individuals very considerably. Despite you know being really successful in increasing the rates of deployment for renewable energy, we're just not making a dent, really, in our carbon intensity across our whole energy system. Annual emissions around the world are up. And this is despite tremendous progress in the renewable energy industry. Who's the sincere environmentalist here? Somebody who's trying to say, yes, let's engineer patiently a solution to this which doesn't impoverish and damage the human species on the planet. And they're always saying, no, no, we've got something that something looks good. I tell uh, decision makers in the United States to study the European example very, very carefully. I mean, you have no excuse for not looking at Europe and learning. We've tested this for you. Europe drove itself into the energy ditch. European leaders poured hundreds of billions into renewables and relied too much on Russian natural gas. Those bets would come back to haunt them.